So this is chapter 11, and the, the goal of this chapter is uh, to understand the assumptions that go into these regression models so that we're aware of them, and then learn some diagnostics uh, to evaluate the, you know, those assumptions, how reasonable they are, how unreasonable they are, uh, and maybe some other things, but that's what I kind of call, that's what I kind of um, got from it. Um, as usual during these things, I'm going to kind of give you my highlights, what I thought was interesting that I'm not going to obviously talk about everything in this chapter, but I want to talk about the things that I thought were interesting or maybe confusing and feel free as usual to jump in at any time. This is a community effort. Mm -hmm. So the first section about the assumptions is, uh, I summarize with these bullet points here. He says the key assumptions, and these are in decreasing order of importance, I guess. And he said the most important assumption is validity. Mm -hmm. Then he turns around and says, "These, this is rarely you really meet all or if any of these criteria." Oh yes, it's kind of the all, all models are wrong type thing, I, I guess. And so he says, "You know, your model should include all relevant predictors." That makes sense. You certainly want to make sure you've yeah. you know, included everything that's important to your uh, to what you're trying to figure out. Uh, your outcome variable, whatever that should be, should accurately reflect the phenomena of interest. Now, what mm -hmm. he means there is that, you know, if you're trying to understand, I don't know. The economy and your your outcome variable though is like gross national product that may not be a really that might be a good proxy might not be a good proxy but you, you, it's something to think about right yeah yeah validity and, is like it's almost kind of, out of the scope of this whole thing because it's not something that statistics typically can really i mean well it's true we can use statistics to compare our measure to other known gold standard measures as a way of assessing validity or you know looking at you know the outcome you know if there's something that we think that this outcome has correlation to down the road if we can predict that thing down the road you might get but yeah it's it's a validity as a topic is is difficult yeah. because, like so you know there's so many things like you mentioned gdp i think it was a gdp or something like you know yeah. the kinds of economic and and um you know different things that you know don't necessarily mean what we think they mean Right. And I think that he doesn't, he says, when he says, you know, how to deal with some of these failures and how to evaluate them, they're not all equally. In right. fact, like this one, like you said, it's probably the hardest one. There's probably not a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. It's really more of the, you know, you, the, it's up to the scientist to really look at the problem and think about it and, right. and understand it, I guess, right? Domain knowledge is important. Yeah. The second most important, he says, representativeness. This makes sense, right? So you want to make sure whatever you sample, you're trying to make some kind of, uh, Generalizations to a population with your sample, you want to make sure your sample represents that. And uh, he, he says, you know, re representative, that is conditioned on the predictors. That's, what, you know, if you're conditioned on the thing, then representativeness is not as important because you've already conditioned on that particular variable. And that's why he says down here that, you know, that's one way to deal with non representatives, add more predictors that control for those things that you'd have in sample as well as you would hope, right? The next one, of course, the regression, regression models we use are additive and linear, so that's an assumption. Your model has to be additive and linear. Um, and if it's not, then you have to do something about that, like transform the predictors. Like if you have multiple, if your model is a multiplication of things, then try a log of there. Like to try the log of your data, turn, turn the multiplication into addition. And linearity you can deal with by you know, adding uh, transforming the predictors themselves or transferring, it's not the predictors, yeah, transforming the predictors um, or adding nonlinear transformations of those predictors is what I mean by that. And like, you know, splines or I mean, that's a kind of exaggeration, but that's kind of the hardest case, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Some kind of a basis set uh, or adding interactions is another thing you might have to do to deal with linearity. Yeah. I'm actually kind of working my way through both these bullet points at the same time, I realized. Uh, another one is the independence of the errors, right? So we're assuming that the residuals or whatever's left over the, the error term in our model is independent. And I don't know if there's much you can do about that, except he does talk about extending the model. Maybe you can add some kind of more complicated measurement error model. Yeah. Deal with that. That's clearly outside of the scope of, of what we're going to probably do in this book, right? But it's something one to be aware of. Way, just, by, by the way, one of the ways that we talked about in you know the last phase book um, was you know the, the way you deal with the, Failure of independence is do mixed models and mixed effects models, right? I mean, by true, but, right? So, I mean, a lot of these that, yeah. things, the, the way that, I don't know that they say, I forget if they said that or not in the chapter, but that's you know one of the strategies, especially if the independence is related, like it has to do with like longitudinality or right, you know, other types of nesting. 
and he says uh, another issue. Now these keep going less less important to him. Equal variance of the errors. So mm -hmm. that one you can deal with if it fails uh, by using some kind of weighted regression type thing, which he did talk about, I think, in a previous chapter. Right. And then uh, normality of the errors. He said this is barely important at all, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because you have to think, wait a minute, that should be very important. My data is not normal. But there's two exercises which are kind of interesting, 11.3, and I guess 11.6 is the one that really addresses it. This shows that is the case. Surprisingly, if, all you, if you care more about the, uh, re, in, this, in this book, we, we more care more about the regression coefficients than we do about pr, you know, prediction accuracy for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. but this is about you know, casual, inf eventually we're going to get to the ideas of you know, casual inference in the part later. Casual, did you say casual inference? Yeah. Instead of, I think you meant causal inference. Causal, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's I do casual. Like, I think we need, I, need, I mean, we, we, we <laughs> come as you are. Because <laughs> the casual inference. That's what I do. Yeah, that, I no, do that's, casual that's, inference. Yeah. <laughs> casual inference is why the book needs to be written because you know we're all guilty of whatever. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, casual, mm -hmm. casual versus causal. That's great. We just invented <laughs> something there. Make a blog post out of that. <laughs> But um, we care more about the regression coefficients. And if you look at the regression coefficients, even the distribution of the regression coefficients, the non-normality of your errors kind of just gets washed out. And it's kind of basically the central limit theorem at work, right? Because the, right. the predictors, the, the, the predictors as a random variable are made up of a sum of all the uh, observ observables, right? Right. A linear combination of them. So that's kind of cool. I didn't realize that. So I was I'm like, I had, I had really had to do those two exercises. I'm like, wait a minute. I want to see this is true. And I did. So yeah, I mean, maybe is it because like, if you, if you do if you really attend to all the stuff above it, you know, usually the normality issue probably takes care of itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It should. So as far as how to deal with the assumptions, I talked about all these, except the last one. Um, one thing you can do is like, hey, you know what? Change your <laughs> change what you're trying to do to match right. the data looks like better. Right? I think that's something you often end up doing. Is like, well, I was trying to get this question, that's not going to happen. How about this other question instead? We'll go yeah. there. Almost here. Speaking of uh, causal inference, <laughs> as opposed yeah. to cause, casual, not, not casual or formal. Uh, yeah. He says more assumptions are needed if regression is going to be given a, a causal interpretation. Uh, and this is what I think I got out of this. A causal effect is the effect of a variable with all else held constant. Yeah. This and actually, I, if I have to pick one thing that has been like sort of most interesting, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things about this book, but I will say I'm guilty of this verbiage, you know, like when we talk about a variable and talk about estimates and model. Yeah. I, I, I tend to be the, the, it's the effect of X. Um, hey, Amma. Hey, Amma, how you doing? Um, it's, um, yeah, I tend to be the, that guy, but it, yeah, because it's, it's really hard to say the average difference in earnings comparing two people who differ by how, you know, that's, it's a, that's the spelling. That's, that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. That's no, the, no, I, that's the casual. The casual. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Funny. Uh, average difference. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. And so just, I thought it would be useful because you think about this a lot. I think this causal versus, um, Mm -hmm. non-causal thing so this is like exercise 11.2 which i kind of just plopped in here maybe we could talk about just for yeah. a minute um so he says for the model in section 7.1 which we don't have to go back and look at it we this is the one where we are predicting the presidential vote share from the economy remember that mm -hmm. yeah yep. and he says describe the coefficient for economic growth right which is just a, a slope in in purely descriptive non-causal terms so how would you do that and not actually asking because i'm not i'm not i'm not sure <laughs> Predicting um, from the economy, so yeah, the economy was like economic growth. Yeah, economic actually. growth, right? Yeah. There's something like you know two percent increase in economic growth led to uh, now I'm using a causal way, but that's you know led to an increase in vote share. That's kind of a causal way to say it, right? Yeah. So you would say something like the the um, the difference, the average difference in vote share comparing two election cycles that differ only in terms of economic growth. <laughs> that would be the non-causal way to say that, right? Or no? That sounds better. Yeah, that sounds good to me for sure. Yeah. It's not too casual because it's really hard to say. <laughs> yeah, no, right? You have to put it, it's not too casual. It's not casual at all, is it? <laughs> non-causal and non-casual. That's right. But people do get very casual with their causal 
<laughs> this, is, this, is, this is indeed true. No? So he does say then we can let's consider the difficulties in interpreting the coefficient as the effect of economic growth on the incumbent party's vote share. I don't understand. It seems like it should be, there should be some kind of causal effect, right? I mean, it seems like economic growth inspires people, you know, to think, oh, this president's doing great. I mean, it's, what are the difficulties? I don't, I, I just well, I mean, because I it could know. be that it's, you know, that this, you know, it could be that there's some other third variable that we haven't considered that is contributing both to, you know, earnings and, or uh, to growth and to, you know, vote share. Okay, I see. So the other factors, it's yeah. saying everything else held constant is the real problem. Right, that makes sense. Right. Kind of, and, and of course, nothing is all ever constant, right? Yeah, and we never, we never ever have enough information, right? So they are saying that the error is saying everything held constant because like in real life can never hold everything constant. Right. Well, yeah, that I think it's more of, um, I think it's more of just that being held constant. It's that by, by having like an estimate for like, say the, the effect of um, growth on vote share is, you know, whatever number you're basically saying, I mean, um, because I think a lot of it has to do with sort of counterfactual reasoning, right? So counterfactual reasoning would be like, if, you know, I hadn't, you know, done X, then why, you know, Y would have happened or not happened. And so I think one of the things that counterfactual kind of statements are inherently sort of causal in their nation, like the way we think about them, I think, right? Um, yeah. So I, I think what we're just trying to do with this language is just be more hedgy i think really and just make sure that we're we're, we're not we're, we're not um assuming that x is causing y I, I guess right like you can't go back in time and like improve the economy and then the president gets reelected. Right. <laughs> yeah. all right so okay. he said we're gonna okay. i, I just have one yeah, yeah yeah question go ahead of course because um i've been also trying to do start rethinking yeah, because he's uh, doing yeah. new videos and he's always like, okay, you can't just look at the data for causes. Like you as the researcher must put the causes in, like no causes in, no causes out. So is it because like really there is no way for economic growth to like temporarily caught like he's looking at causation in terms of like biology kind of ways of causation economic growth cannot really cause vote share so like that's why in this example it's hard to talk how to how to describe because it's like you're just you've done the regression and then like you are trying to interpret but like that's not how it should be. Like you should sort of go into the whatever you're trying to do with some idea of what you think the causes are. Or mm -hmm. yeah, I think. But you, yeah, I agree with you there. I think that I remember that from uh, Cisco rethinking. Again, I think that we're just kind of like kind of teasing this right now. Part four of this book is entirely, you know, a good quarter of the book. Well, more than that. I don't know. If that's that much of the book. <laughs> It's all about this. So <laughs> we're going to get a deep dive into, into causal inference and it'll be not be casual at all. Uh, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I thought that was interesting. Um, the next section. So that was basically the assumptions part. Now the rest of this whole chapter is all about looking at your data, looking at your regression, mm -hmm. trying to diagnose it in various ways. So I'm going to go through some of this kind of fast because he kind of repeats, he retreads some of the same ground again. So he talks about fitting the data in the model. Well, we know how to do that. We did it already in chapter nine, right? For, he, you know, he demonstrates a simple case of a, a single input, uh, the case of, you know, two lines, like with a um, categorical uh, predictor mm -hmm. added in. Yeah. yeah. Um, talks about using simulations to display the uncertainty in your slope. So we did that. One thing that was new to me anyway, uh, is the idea of when you have like multiple input variables, one way you can make a plot, you can make, you know, n plots, for each one, you hold all the other predictors at their average value to show some uh, some way the um, average effect of each one of these yeah. input predictors. I mean, that's kind of what you do. I mean, effectively, when you do when you when you, when you um, post when you do an interaction plot, you know, right. effectively, what you're doing is averaging all the 
other covariates and whatnot. And um, the other thing he talks about is this idea, which I've never seen this kind of plot before, where you plot um, your outcomes versus a linear predictor, which is basically your regression, right? So you plot the outcome versus the regression. And that looks yeah. like this. So I, this, by the way, this example is from that um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. verse version. So I just yeah. copied it in here, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to go through all the steps that it is, but basically he has K predictors. Each one of them has a slope. This basically whatever the, you know, this one has a slope mm -hmm. of one, this one has a slope of two, three, four, five, right? And he adds some noise to it. He has a, uh, one categorical variable, Z, right, to it just to make it a little more complicated. So this yeah. would be like kind of a mess to plot, you said, because you need like, you know, at least 10 plots. Or, and it, if, that is if you put in the two, you know, the two categories on the same plot or even 20 plots, maybe. Um, it's, you might want to do that anyway at some point for your own work. But when you're trying to display results, he suggested this plot that yeah. you do, which is outcome versus your predicted value, which right. of course could, you know, be around this vertical line. I think that's kind of cool. Um, I'm not really sure what this buys you over just having a residual plot at that point. But yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, here's what we know. I mean, like, you obviously, um, I mean, just eyeballing it, the, um, the, the, the actual val um, the, the, the predicted values are falling kind of like evenly on both sides of the line. Right. You know what I mean? If it was like only on one side, that would be, or if it was bunched up on different um, ends of the spectrum of predicted value, like, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I see. No, I, yeah, that. I guess there could be some value, like if for small predictive values, it tended to bunch up on the top and for high predictive values, it tend to pick up on the bottom. But I still think you would see that in a, in a residual plot. Yeah, probably. No, I agree. I, yeah, I'm just thinking like, I'm just trying to think of any value. But yeah, if it was like, if you had like clear heteroscedasticity where it's like, you know, on uh, the, the lower end, those, those residual, those, the different, the, the, the dots from the line are, are much bigger. And then they, maybe they narrow as you get higher. I mean, that would be a problem. That would be yeah. like um, yeah, and, and to be honest with you, like a residual versus um, was it predicted plot? Like, I mean, uh, um, yeah, yeah, and that's no. the next section we talked about residual yeah. plot. So I just this is this from that continuing that same example now, just plotting the residual plot, which yeah. is basically it's saying the same thing and is a little bit easier to look at, to my view. But I don't know. I just thought maybe if you had any, have you ever used one of those? Oh yeah, I, versus mean, I do these like I do these. I have a, I have like functions in R that I just like run these habitually. Like whenever I do a model. No, not the residual. Yeah, you definitely want to look at the residuals. But do you do the outcome versus predicted value without that that previous plot? Oh, um, yeah, sometimes I mean, not probably not. But I guess can you scroll. I mean, I guess what I would just say is this: like, look at how interpretable this is. Like, if there was like weirdness, like if there was heteroscedasticity okay. or something, where like the you know the. The, the dots were farther from the line on one side or the, you know of one end of the spectrum of predicted value versus another you would just kind of the, the story would be a little more evident but then if you go down to the residuals and um can you yeah um i mean what you're looking for is like kind of like they call, people talk about the football you know like a football yeah. shape you know where it kind of like on the two ends it, it sort of is it narrows and then it kind of balloons in the center i mean you don't really have me you kind of have that here it's not perfect but yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I, I would probably, I like, I'd probably do both just as a way to look okay. at it side by side. But yeah, I agree with you. This is like, you know, there's, um, this, this has a, a utility all its own. There's no question, you know. In the next section he talks about, and I, I did put it in here just because I wanted to work through it, but I don't think I'll talk about it for a long time. Oh, Alma? Mm hmm has her hand up. Yeah, so like from what we did in base rules, because we did lots of like Resident. post um posterior predictive checks. And do you would you still do that and still do the residual fitted, residual predicted plots? Or you just do your posterior predictive checks? And I would do both. I mean, I would definitely want to look at the residuals and see what they look like, and then also do the posterior predictive checks that we'll talk about here shortly um, to, to check the distribution makes sense. Okay. okay. At least understand okay. it. And like he says, he says just because it doesn't look, just because a posterior predictive check doesn't look exactly like your data doesn't mean you should, you know, toss everything out. It just means that some parts of the model, some the model doesn't capture everything. You should understand what things it doesn't capture. But, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but anyway, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get there. Um, now, this next section I'm going to skim through, but he, the idea here was simply that you shouldn't 
uh, plot. Um, I got to scroll down. You shouldn't plot your residuals versus observed values. Right. And that makes perfect sense to me because it's kind of regression of the mean type thing where the smaller observed values are going to be associated with the negative residuals because that's two ways you can get small, right? You yeah. can get small by being a negative residual and get small by just being small. So <laughs> that's all you're seeing there. So right. you should only plot by predicted value. And he does give an example of using uh, fake data to understand it. But I'm just going to skip past that for hey, this. Can, I, can we just stop on this for a second? So this, yeah, was visual versus, this, this is not a good graph or the, a good figure here. Like, I mean, that means it's not... I mean, like, do you see how, like, the lower end of the predicted values are, like, all wonky, and then we, they, we get, like, kind of a different shape to the distribution? Yeah, you're yeah. right. You're right. This is, that's inter this is from real data, so. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. It's from, what is it from? It's from, uh, the, no, no, this is this simulated? No, it's from, yeah, some grades. Oh, it's homework. Yeah, yeah, it's homework. Yeah, homework data. Yeah. Homework data, yeah. Homework data, yeah. yeah. Anyway. But the, per the purpose of doing the fake data thing was just to show this is not some fluke of the data that happens even if you just generate, um, you generate the data with the simulated data, right? You get the same effect, uh, no big surprise there. So this is actually simulated data. I don't know, do you consider this to be a, he said, this is the type of plots you would see even if the model were perfectly correct, which it is because we just generated it. Mm. What is your diagnostic of this residual plot? I mean, it looks better than the other one, but not much. I mean, it's this is one of the nice things about fake data, right? Because you can say, okay, well, that looks really wonky. Well, let's generate some fake data. Well, this is kind of wonky too. Maybe I shouldn't be too yeah, judgmental. No, that's, that, no, that's true. No, that's actually, absolutely. Yeah. So, no, I think well put. I mean, like if you yeah. can see a somewhat similar shape, yeah. You know, even if it's wonky, then yeah. These yeah. are truly just randomly, this, this, this is truly just random normal distribution dots. That's all these dots are. Yeah. <laughs> the residuals are perfectly normal. I mean that in a statistical sense. <laughs> right. Not the casual sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> anyway, um, what are we doing next? Oh, now this is the part about the uh, replication. So this is this is the other use of simulation. We've used simulation for uh, other tasks that I didn't write down there where he gave a list of what the other things we used them for. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the most important things we used it for was for propagating errors, right? Use the simulation because then we have error. We have now draws from the coefficients, which tells us, you know, how you know how they're correlated. How they are. Yeah. yeah, and how good they are, right? So this example is also again from the the tidy yep. ROS, tidy ROS, which is great stuff. I just caught, cut and paste in here. I hid the code because you know, you don't necessarily need to see it here. Uh, I will post this. This I'll push this up to the notes. So, so if you want. So is this like by the way? Is this a book down type of a deal? That this, this this document that you're looking into. Did, did yeah, this is the this is the this is just the notes. I mean, I haven't I haven't pushed them yet to the GitHub, but they'll be on our notes thing. No, I know, but like in terms of like you, um, so this this whole thing you have notes on all of the, these chapters, and this is I didn't write them all though, but oh, oh you did. didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, never mind. So it's a, it's you know it's a GitHub. You know, you, every, for this book, you, anyone can. Yeah. You know, push changes to it. We haven't been doing much of that, but I, every time I do it, I try to do it. <laughs> yeah, like, I need to do that. Yeah, I, have, I take a bunch of notes I should add. Yeah. So this is uh, the other use now. Another use is posterior predictive checking. And the simple idea here is just to simulate data sets, right? So you've got draws of the coefficients and you've got, including the sigma, the, the noise model. And now you're going to generate fake data essentially using those draws and then generating the appropriate noise model on top of that, right? So, uh, so he gives an example here. This is a very simple model. It's just a, uh, a one variable model, right? Y, an outcome. And this is, these are measurements of the speed of light. These numbers are like nanosecond deviations from some particular value. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really matter. It's just it's some number that represents the, uh, the time of flight for photons, right? And he, he says, well, let's see how this, how well this works. Um, so we can try fitting it to a, you know, a model work constant term, right? Um, there's the data there. And then we can use that fit to simulate from the, the predictive distribution, distribution. And the, there's a lot here, but all you, the, the only part that does anything is, where the heck is it? Should I leave that part up? Oh, here it is. <laughs> this is the only part that does anything, right? Yeah. Just simulating normal distribution with the mean from the same. So I guess I should walk through this because it's kind of uh, yeah. uh, useful to understand how to use these fit objects, right? 
Right. I think we've seen it before, but I'm just going to go through it again just to remind myself <laughs> more than anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So this yeah. as Tibble thing, right, will take a fit object and turn it into an object, uh, in basically into a Tibble of draws, where each uh, the Tibble will have a column for the um, the well, if there was anything, this one only has one thing, the intercept, but oh, it has two things: so intercept and sigma, right? right. And if there were slopes, there'd be things for the slope too. Federico, you had a thumbs up. Did you have an observation question or was that just agreeing? Yeah. <laughs> what was that you broke up there? Yeah, I have a good uh, I have a microphone. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you on that one, but you can type in the chat instead if you want to as well. Hey, can we talk about okay so this reframe thing what that's a new title you know so it's it's funny that's the funny you mentioned that let me just get out of that so Frederick, if you have a question maybe you could type it into the chat and then we'll yeah. see it by the way there's only one little flaw with this which i guess is well, i mean i guess it depends on what you want to do after. i didn't write this by the way so oh you didn't except for oh, the yeah, reframe guess... part and i'll tell you about that in a second okay um why is this stupid thing down here go away oh shoot i just broke the thing this is um yeah, I, I, it's it's um it's it's funny how I, I work with dplyr every day and there's still tons of things that I, I don't know about it. Hang on, I get the. I think I just closed our studio. <laughs> um, this is Windows 11. I'm getting used to it. I thought like the pop up thing. Like, what yeah. is that? Go away. Do I have to rebuild the whole thing? I just net this here. Anyway, I'll just tell you now as well, we're waiting for this scene to come back up. Uh, when I, I copied the code from the ROS uh, GitHub, it gave an error saying, oh, this is you know deprecated now. Don't use summarize here, use reframe. So I thought uh -huh. I switched to reframe. And then when I went to another computer, ran, I said, what the heck's reframe? <laughs> the computer, I had an old version of dplyr. <laughs> and it was yeah. like, what the, so that's, so reframe just allows you to do these kind of summaries where you're, uh, we, you're shoving a bunch of rows in for each for each group, basically, is what it does. Right. You know, as far as I know, I only just learned about yesterday, so <laughs> yeah, that may not be the best description. But I was just going to say, like, this is totally ticky tacky. But after you finish that, um, you'd always want to um, have another pipe, and then the next line should be ungroup. No, but reframe doesn't. That's the other thing. Reframe doesn't group. That's what's. But, you, but it's a group by row number. I yeah, thought. reframe doesn't ungroup automatically. Mm. Yeah, that's another weird thing about reframe. Yeah, okay. Mm, magic stuff, though. Yeah, right. All right. Let me reshare the screen again. Sorry about that. There's a little window blocking the thing, and I try to get rid of it. And... You know, I think I get those who are our purists now. You just have to learn, like, SFLI doesn't change. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, it's true like that, that's actually one right. of the real concerns is like you know sh you know packages just do they make you better or worse who knows yeah. they're always they're always deprecating things and giving you warnings like come on man it worked last week <laughs> yeah it was yeah. fine anyway so sims just turns the takes from the fit when you apply i'm sorry when as tibbles applied to a fit object it just turns it into a tibble with the columns are the different fit parameters which case there's only two the intercept and sigma uh, and then all we're doing here is uh, taking the Sims object and then adding in a row number just so we can group by it and group by the row number, and then using yeah. the magic reframe to generate for, um, you know, and, you know, for the, the size of the data set, right? So we're making, we're making uh, for each of the rows, which is 4,000 of them in that mm -hmm. table. Now we're making 43, I think there was data points, 66, sorry, it's right here, 66 new rows, which are uh, simulated Newcomb data sets, right? Supposedly, this is what. So she should be look similar to what Newcomb did, right? 66 data points simulated from this model. And you can now look at some of them. Here's some of them. And they don't really look much like the Newcomb model because they don't have that low, those low outliers, right? Yeah. Wow. That's quite a bit of variability. Yeah. I love this kind of stuff because you, you can look at these things. Okay. Because you, sometimes you look at your data, like let's say your data was like, I don't know, this one right here, 15, 26, right? Like, well, does that little bump there mean something, or is there two peaks here? But no. you know, but there is it really, right? If that can just yeah. happen by chance. Kind of, yeah. kind of interesting. Get get used to that kind of thing. I think if anything, what it should tell you is is that like we're probably guilty of over interpreting the data that we actually collect. Right. You know, 
or that like that thinking that exactly the, yeah the or distribution that we have is um yeah. it means something sometimes that, that it's, it's it's so hard to not to just take that too far Federica you had a question you can just interrupt here by the way we're fine with that. yeah um can you hear me now yeah no yep gotcha okay great um can you just uh, um go back to the previous slide uh yeah the code or the, uh, well, the plots? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, the code. What do you reframe and then you assign y to R norm? So yes. you okay. So this is assigning the normal distribution to um to predict basically. So um this is the Bayesian part basically, no? So we uh, use the feet from the stun. Yes. So stun, but what stun does? Because then, then I, I reframe it with with an R norm. So stun doesn't use any of the um, prior distributions inside the. It does. So that's all happened up here when we did the fit with stand GLM. Now I didn't specify prior, so it's just going to automatically use its own weekly informative priors. Um, but at this point, this is the posterior distribution of what I'm getting it from Sims here. In Sims, is the post is samples samples from the posterior distribution of the parameters given the priors and given the data that we gave it to it. Right in this case, the parameter is only two, the intercept and sigma. And so each Sims has got four thousand samples of the posterior distribution. For each one of those. I'm generating a data set, a new simulated data set that would have come that would come about if those parameters were the true parameters. And that's why it becomes a 4,000 by 66 row tibble, a giant little tibble. Yeah. Does that help at all? Yeah. Um, this is 20 of them. As, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I uh oh. Breaking up. Yeah, your microphone shorted out again. It sounds like it's shorting, like like maybe there's a connector issue with it. And this reframe is new to me too. So I mean, I just found out about the, the code on the GitHub has summary. And then when I ran it, our complaint saying, don't use summary. Um. <laughs> so I said, use reframe, like, okay. But then I looked at the documentation of reframe. Yeah, reframe does exactly what I want, even on groups at the end. Just, this is how you can just generate and new come new rows for each um, each row number. Yeah. So okay. So moving on to so, uh, uh, a question. Yes. So okay. Uh, I don't know if you ever did the the stats rethinking book. I started it, but I didn't finish it because I was okay. I wanted to do it as a book club, but then because it's not free, we we did Bayes rules yeah. instead. That's how that whole thing yeah. got started, actually. So it's like we had the picture you showed at first, the very first picture. Uh, oh, the real data, yeah. Well, that's a sample, right? Or that's the real data. That's the real data that Newcomb took painstakingly. So isn't so you don't think this is a sample from a population? It's like well, it is in some sense. It's some sample from if he did this experiment a lot more times, but um, okay. So because it's like if it, it's like from what I was thinking, okay, so this is a sample, and there's a real distribution that we are trying to get. So maybe yeah. that's why it is different from. What we got in this sample is different from the posterior prediction. Yeah, it's that's true. Why, why? Our, well, our model is not good enough. What we're going to get to is our model is not a good model for this distribution. That's what we're going to get to on this. You'll see. Okay. So, so we, it, if, we need more data to make a model better or? Well, or we just we need just, a different model. Mm, we're just using like a normal a, distribution a different model, right? A different model would be from which side well we could use a as you'll see um 
we could use like in um, the fit side in the book, in the book keeps, in the fit side right you can't do anything about the other side that's data that's been taken okay. but we you know of course we could take more data but if we want to look at this data we could say well this data doesn't really match well uh the model we're using here now, so maybe we would use a different distribution for example this assumes a normal distribution but we could use a t distribution which has longer tails maybe it would fit it better um, if we produce okay, those outliers okay. right if we had a t distribution we'd see some outliers like that but maybe the outliers are only on the left side the slow the slow side or whatever then we should maybe use an asymmetrical distribution of some kind so there's different options what we could think about there um okay. that he talks about so so that's what you're supposed to do first you have your sample you do first prior predictive checks, then you do posterior predictive checks, yeah, and then CPC. after that, if your data and your posterior predictive checks don't are not in what level is okay. I know we are not supposed well, this, to do what level is okay because we're well, not. It depends. <laughs> as, uh, as you'll see, as he talks about in the book, it depends. My, at least my understanding of it, I should say is it depends, like sometimes it's okay. It's like, you know, my model doesn't capture that part, but that's okay, because that doesn't really, I'm just, I'll make sure I'm clear about that in my documentation, but it doesn't mean it's not a useful model, right? Remember, all models are wrong, right? So you're never gonna get perfect <laughs> agreement with your PPC. All you might get good agreement, but you might say, oh, this doesn't capture this, that's okay. It's still, I can still reliably uh, make some uh, conclusions about the regression coefficients or whatever, right? Okay. So. so I'm just trying, it's all mixed up in my head. So I'm just trying to yeah, me too. sort know, things out. Yeah. No, yeah. So the, the normal distribution part we did was the likelihood part. And we said we used a, a wrong model for the likelihood. The likelihood, part. yeah, that's right. Yeah. I yeah. Agree, yeah. Ooh. Or the model, I wouldn't say wrong model, but this model doesn't capture everything that we saw in the data. That's what I would say. <laughs> all models are wrong. So just saying it's wrong to me is not a good thing to say because <laughs> yes it's like tautology yeah. yeah 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 that's true so uh by the way all this we just did that last slide that complicated function well not that complicated all that tidy verse stuff can be done very simply with just posterior predict right so that was just showing you basically how the posterior prediction works in detail but our stand has a function that does it in one line posterior predict boom now each row of this matrix is 66 columns of simulated da newcomb data so i got the same thing Right, so I got four thousand rows of six six columns of simulated data, and we can turn that Y rep tidy I made previously into a matrix of the same shape and show that with, since I use the same seed, they are identical. Right, so this simple one liner does the same thing as a more complicated thing last time, but it just to help on illustrate how it works uh, is the reason for doing that. But you just use posterior predict and you're off to the races, and then you can use Bayes plot to plot the uh, kernel density of the data and the data itself and uh, some sample replicates of the. So this is another like one uh, one liner, but almost a one liner, right? Oh wait, that's the wrong function. Oh yeah, no, this is from base PPC density overlays from the base plot package, which I think is built in with when you install R scan because I don't have to install anything else to make this work, but I'm not sure. Anyway, um, you can see here again. You can see this doesn't seem to. Uh, capture the data very well, right? Because you yeah. see these, the faint lines are the PPC check lines and the solid line is the data as a you know kernel estimate, right? And you can see that, um, uh, so he says one way, that, what, this is kind of important is that you can turn these kind of observations, well, this, the outliers aren't captured. You can turn these kind of vague statements into a concrete statement by saying like, for example, using this, making up your own statistic, right? My statistic here is what's the minimum value, for example, right? And there's another nice function in uh, this package called PPC stat. You can say, okay, given the truth data and given my uh, rep, my so my simulated data, and I'm going to choose minimize the, the minimum value as a stat. What does it look like, right? And you can see the minimum value of all my draws, all my simulated data, is somewhere like over here from zero minus twenty to zero. The minimum for um, the data is way down here, so it really mm -hmm. shows that none of my simulations had a minimum even anywhere close to this. Uh, so wow. this model, you know, so he says this model doesn't work. Uh, you might want to, he says, use a revised model. God, my spelling is so bad. Alma's got her hand up. Oh, sorry, Alma. I was, wasn't looking up there. Go ahead. Maybe. Uh, okay. Okay. So like, I, I, as I said, I'm still juggling everything in yeah. my mind. So like, 
remember what we also did base rules we like one of the examples we we're trying to do was like in the end you're using posterior uh, predictive checks to predict whether you take a number or not right so you are seeing that like if you are using this model is whatever is going to predict is going to be something in the light blue right and what that distribution is well like with with the data that we have it it's not giving it's not close to the data that we have like right it's not predicting the same distribution right as the data that we have okay okay so um huh. like does this happen a lot you do all this work and then what, what do you do you just write me your paper that i have to start again isn't that like they like <laughs> okay okay but is it th that we we did not because there are some like, assumptions we are supposed to do before we do normal distribution it means we didn't check those assumptions yeah, we check like yeah, we want to check those assumptions. That's what we're doing here. Oh, well, this is more than just. I mean, in a more complicated model, this would be checking more than just the normal assumption. We're checking all kinds of other assumptions in your model too by doing this posterior predictive check. But let me just give you the other. Well, I, actually, I didn't put the other example here. The next example he does this is he does a predictive simulation. God, more misspellings. And. Um, to a time series model. And I didn't put that in here, but this section of the book is, is worth going through, of course. And he looks at these um, time series data and he simulates the time series data based on his model. And he sees that the model uh, is more jagged. The time series goes up and down much more often than the actual real data does. And so he, again, invents a statistic. In this case, it's kind of the, what do you call it? This measure, measure of jaggedness. Switch. Yeah. He invents a measure of jaggedness. And he says, yeah, my data is, <laughs> clearly much more, much less jagged than my model is. But that doesn't mean, he says, doesn't mean I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna necessarily throw out my model at this point. May, you know, may still do what I want, but I just have to be aware of the fact that that particular aspect of the data is not captured by the model. And whether or not you have to turn around and fix that particular thing, I mean, you're never gonna capture every aspect is what the point is. You wanna make sure you capture the important aspects. Right. Um, what, what he actually says is somewhere, right? Um, the point of this test, yeah, he yeah. says, here's, what, here's exactly what he says. The point of this test is not to reject the autoregression. No model is perfect after all, but rather to see this particular aspect of the data, its smoothness is not well captured by the fitted model. So I think there needs to be a lot of um, your own uh, experience and your own uh, understanding and your own uh, domain knowledge to come into this and understand which parts of your model that you're okay with not being that great. <laughs> right? So for whatever you're trying to do. And I think in this book, he's continuing to give us some hints on how to do that, but it's certainly something that's not like a cookbook, you know? No, I actually put that here. Okay. Anyway. Okay. So that was that part. Um, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. 15 minutes to go through all this might be a challenge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't have to go through all of this today, especially with the cross validation, man. That's like, a, yeah, let's, let's see what we get. But. Yeah. Let's see what we get. So the next section is about, uh, he, now he makes the point here in this section is that he's gonna talk about the residual standard deviation, but he, he wants to emphasize it in this book, he doesn't consider that particular aspect of the data to be the most important aspect, right? But nevertheless, he, this, these are things you're probably familiar with, the sigma is the residual standard deviation, R squared, we call that the fraction of the variance explained, or there's some other names for it too, the, uh, the coefficient of determination, right? Um, and he, you know, it's usually defined something like this, where R squared is one minus the unexplained, right? The fraction of the unexplained uh, variance, right? So sigma squared is the unexplained variance and SY squared is the original variance before you do any fitting the variance of, of, the, of the outcome variable, right? You've seen this before, I assume everyone has, right? Oh yeah. So he also uh, then defines uh, for least squares anyway, for that particular case, you can compute R squared directly from the explained variance, which is you take a look at the you know the variance of your predicted outcome, right, over the uh, the total variance, and yeah. that works out to be the same in that particular. Show that, and I didn't try to figure it out, but he, he says it turns out to be the same. And it turns out to be more useful for this 
idea of the Bayesian R squared. Yeah. Um, so he says for Bayesian inference, it's not least squares, right? It's not. And uh, so these formulas disagree. So he defines his own uh, uh, Bayesian R squared by, with this ratio is different because in the denominator, we have the variance of the outcomes, right? And added to the, uh, uh, the to the, um, oh, that should be, yeah. That's, that's the sigma square, that's the, that's the model variance, or that's the sample variance, or that, population variance, really. Yeah, that should be SY, right, shouldn't it? Yeah, I think so, I mean. Oh, uh, it's called sigma. Oh, no, it's, it is sigma, so I, I, I misunderstood it. So it, should, it actually does have kind of the same magnitude of this, because this thing at the bottom is the total variance, right? The total variance is the variance in the outcome plus the residual variance, right? <laughs> and the top part is just the variance in the, out, in the predicted outcome. So this is the Bayesian R squared. The superscript S there is important because you do this for, God, now they're misspelling. I only see them when I'm talking through these things. It's not that big of a deal. Um, this is this is a compute. This is computed for each draw, right? So this is not a single value. This is a, a, a fourth, you know, by four thousand draws. This is four thousand R squareds, right? For each possible draw of the of the values, right? Mm. Um, and fortunately, we don't have to do that ourselves. There's a function in R, uh, phase R two fit, and it'll give you the draws, right? And so, for example, for that kid score one that we've been playing around with for a while, right? Yeah. Kid score, Mo high school, Mo IQ. Uh, we can plot the. Uh, we can calculate the Bayesian R squared. And then we can plot the histogram of it, and there it is. So there, the median is somewhere around 0.21, but there's some just some distribution in the R squared. That should be a capital R, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we feel pretty good about that R squared. Huh? Yeah, yeah, because we actually have some uncertainty about it, which is kind of cool. But I mean, it's, it's if it was just like weird or skewed or something, yeah. you'd yeah. probably be like, what's the, what, what, what goes on? So I don't, that, he kind of just, you know, that section just kind of, you know, tells us this. He doesn't really say much about why we would care about it, but there it is. It's introduced, if you need R squared, there's your R squared. Yeah. Uh, the next section goes on to validation. And the first thing he talks about is external validation, which obviously the litmus test of your model is to test it against some new data you get, right? Um, so you need some observations that weren't used to fit your mode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your model. Uh, and perhaps, you know, future, in, in, in the example he gives in the book, he talks about some, you know, test scores, maybe because a future test scores, you see how well your model works. Or as we usually do is we have some final holdout of data, you know, test data that we, we don't actually um, use when we fit our model. We save it to the very end after we've done all our model comparisons and everything else, uh, we save that to the end. So that leaves the question like, well, how can we do model comparison? Um, and that's where cross-validation comes in. This allows us, the main purpose of cross-validation is really to compare different models yep. in my view. And that's what I think he's, he says in here too, right? He says evaluate and compare, but mostly what he talks about is comparing models without waiting for new data. And if you're not familiar with cross-validation, this the concept is pretty simple. You just partition your data up into, you know, K sets, maybe N sets, you know, leave one out where you, you have every possible thing left uh, partitioned out. And then you just fit it to all the, all the other partitions except for one, and then test it on the left out partition. That's cross-validation in a nutshell, mm -hmm. right? So he talks about different kinds of this thing, the leave one out, we'll talk more about that. K-fold, we'll talk more about that. And then these are two that he doesn't talk about in the group. Leave one out, one group out, that's for the multi-level thing. I don't know much more about that. And leave future out, yeah. which is sometimes called walk forward, which is used for uh, time series data, which is also uh, beyond the scope of this book, but it's something you can definitely Google and find out how to do if you have to deal with time series data. I'm gonna a question. What's up, Mama? What's happening? <laughs> so uh when you do cross validation you have let's say you have two models like what you said first we had the normal distribution and then let's say we had the t test one are you going to do, end up doing like an error analysis or like how how do you end up like this is actually a really good question so let me go on because this is uh this leads us to this epld uh which is kind of a model agnostic uh, metric, right? So it doesn't, doesn't rely, it doesn't care what kind of model you use. Uh, right. this, is, um, this is, EPLD is summarizes how good your model is at predicting new data. Like how surprised are you at new data from the way your model would expect? 
and it's based only on the on the posterior probability distributions and therefore is agnostic to what you're you know whatever probability distribution you're using in your model it's going to be reflected in this measure uh right and essentially it's the um sum over the log of the pointwise probability of a new data set from your fitted models so that's a big mouthful i think um there's a reference to the, the galmont paper where he talks about how this epl DLU thing works it describes this a little more detail but I think yeah, I'm not familiar at, with that. I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't get this far in the chapter. I didn't finish this part of the chapter, so I'm a little bit guilty. Well, this this is the um, the common. This is used quite often in Bayesian because there is a nice uh, shortcut algorithm for doing it, uh, for calculating it for leave one out anyway. It doesn't require you to actually do the leave one out. It's fast, in other words. So that's what makes it nice. But if you are doing it the brute force way, essentially all you're doing is you predict your you ask you what's the probability, right, of the, of the left out data set given a model fit on the, all the other terms, okay? And you take the log of it to make the log uh, probability. And you sum that up for all the data points. That's the EPLD LU. So let me say it a different way because I think it's important to understand it. But um, what you're doing is you take your data, right? You fit it, take your data, and you leave one out. Let's say I left out the 10th data point. I'm going to fit everything but the 10th data point, right? And then I make a prediction for that 10th data point, what it should be. And I can, and not only do I, I don't just make a prediction, I make a probabilistic distribution because we're Bayesian, right? So I have a probability distribution for what the 10th the, the thing should be, right? And then mm -hmm. I look at what the actual 10th thing is. Well, if it's way out there on the tails of that probability distribution, that's very surprising. And I would get a very low score for that. In this case, when I take the log of it, it would become a very uh, negative score, right? Uh, right, so that'd be a bad score. If it was in near the middle of the distribution, that's a good score. My model was not surprised by this outcome that came, came out. So if that didn't make sense, let's look at the code. So here's <laughs> the brute force uh, code. I'm gonna take the, this uh, vector right here is a vector of the scores, uh, just set to zero, this just gets it ready. Then I'm gonna go through every element and I'm doing the kid IQ data, by the way, right? So for every row in kid IQ, there's 434 of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. If for every row, the reason why I know that because this is really slow. Uh, <laughs> How long did it take? Uh, like five minutes, which is oh, that's not bad. Oh, No, but it's not something I want to run when I'm compiling this thing. So these are all e value equals faults. <laughs> but I was uh, reading like to, back to our conversation before we started, Ron. So I've been reading about like this decision, like these these choice models, and they people started doing hierarchical Bayes in the early 2000s and there was a I was reading a paper from back then and it said that like one person took two weeks for wow. um, all of their um, hierarchical base stuff to run because you know back then that was yeah computers you know, <laughs> what did you have maybe you had a couple of gigs in your hard drive and you know your ram was god knows you know anyway um so i think you know, we have like five minutes. I can probably get through this. Nah, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, well, whatever. Whatever you want to do is fine. Well, or we could just leave it out till next time. Um, leave it out because that's uh, what you do when you cross <laughs> all well, Let me just okay, finish this okay. section right here. No, no, no. Is, question. Question. Oh, okay, so, yeah. what's the difference between the leave one out and the K fold? Like, leave one out is like, like a single one if you have 50. You you use forty nine and you leave one out, but yeah, K fold is what like the difference because I know you K -fold explained it is, to me the last is you, time. Yeah, K fold you divide your data set up into K divisions, right? I guess I can look at my example here, right? Um, I don't know if this is obvious or not, but uh, it requires too much to talk through the code, but. Um, yeah, because I think what you said the last time is like you divide it into, let's say, four divisions. You take yeah. one division and you just keep sampling from that one division. No. Oh. Uh, so let's say, look, I like your example. Let's say I take my data set and I randomly divide it into four sets. It has to be random, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. then I take three of those four sets and fit the model. And then mm -hmm. I test the model on that fourth set I left out, right? The holdout set. Okay. And then I do okay. that every possible way. Then I use the other the other three, you know, now you do that with, I leave a different one out and do that four times essentially, right? The four times I have to do it. And then I can average those results together, take the standard deviation of those results or whatever. And, and, and huh. So it's like leave one out is just like K fold. Yeah, with NK, N folds. <laughs> Where ends the number N of data sets, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So it's like when they got more computational power, it's like, okay, if we can just let's leave everything out. Mm -hmm. But then when you leave one out, then you are just, you run your model on the 49 variables and then you use your posterior predictive to go and predict yeah. the 50th Here, one. Look at this code right here, which is doing just that, right? So here's the leave one out. I'm going through for each row in the kid IQ data. I'm going mm -hmm. to fit it. What am I fitting here? I'm fitting kid score, mom high school, mom IQ. Here's my data. There's the leave out minus I. That mm. leaves out the row that I'm working on right now. I've left it out. I'm not using it to fit the data. Right. Then I do a mm -hmm. prediction, right? I'm using Lin predict because I don't want to put the noise in yet. Um, and here, my new data is the left out row. There yeah. it is. So I'm now predicting on the left out row. So now we've got uh -huh. a prediction. Uh, now here, I'm just grabbing the Sigma draws for the fit, right? Because I need those. And then I now going to compute. Can you explain the if, so I'm sorry, if I is modulo? Oh, this is just because it's so slow. I just want to make sure it was actually making progress. <laughs> so this, oh, this just prints a little progress report. Okay, we got 50, we're at 50, we're at 100, we're at 150. Okay, things are happening. Right? Got it, yeah, sorry. It's just, I don't, because sometimes you start running the code, like, is anything happening? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, is this going to take three hours or four minutes? I have no yeah. idea. So that's the way you do it. I was printing every 10th eye and I slowed down. But anyway, um, so then here I calculate the probability of my prediction, right? Given my model, which is, this is, I'm sorry, this, yeah. No, sorry. Probability of the actual outcome, kid score I for the ith outcome, the left out one, right? Compared to what my model predicted. And that should be, a no my model is a normal distribution. So what is the probability that I would have seen a value like that? What's Right. So I just put in this the sigma from the draw. This calculates D norm calculates that probability. Right. Yeah. And then I take the log of it. Well, I take the mean of it, too, because don't forget, I have 4000 draws of the sigma. So I need to take the mean of that, too. And 4000 predictions, too, by the way. Right. Because this is Bayesian. So I take the mean of all those draws and then I take the log. And I shove it in the scores thing. So that's that's kind of the hard way to do it. <laughs> right. By okay, hand. So, okay. like, what what is it? Don't good do this. Scores? Don't do this. By the way, this is brutal. Don't ever do this. <laughs> it's just to show you so, how it works. What is a good score? Because you're seeing like you don't want your good scores question. to be negative. You don't. Well, you, they always yeah. be negative. They always be negative because I'm taking a log of, of these small values. Okay. They'll always be negative. Um, good question. You don't. There's the scores are somewhat arbitrary. The only thing they're useful for is comparing two models. Right. Right. So oh, okay. So, like, if you have another score, would you use the SD or the scores itself? The scores. You use... I'll show you. Let me just go quickly down here. But we'll, we can close on this section. And I guess maybe next week, Ryan, right before you go, I'll yeah. finish off the K-fold real quick. I think this would be good to, like, revisit this regardless. You know what I mean? Just because okay. this is, like, pretty dense. Uh, yeah. All right. We'll just, we'll, I'll pick it up next week. But let me just quickly go through. Uh, rather than doing all this, code, you can just call a, sync, a simple function in, in stand called Lou. It'll, now, this is different. Lou is very fast because Lou doesn't actually do that. It doesn't loop through all the things. It uses some uh, probabilistic model that Galmont figured out to quickly calculate an approximation of the Lou. Uh, it's a pretty good approximate, 1876, and I got 1876. So the approximation is dead on, but this thing's fast. It's like, like that. It just spits out the number. Um, and then I can get this EPL do and then standard error. But still, this is not that useful. I really need to compare models, right? Mostly useful to compare models. Right. So you can, I can fit a different model where I only fit on the high school, right? Right. Not, not also the MIQ. And mm -hmm. I can do a loop for that. And then you can do this cool function loop compare, which will tell you now the cool thing like, oh, these are different by 38 whatever's, right? 38 yeah, EPLD units. log units. But this is now this is where the standard error comes in that eight. Okay. This is significant difference, right? It's because the standard error on the, on the EPLD ELPD is, is only eight. So 38 is a significant difference between these two models. So I should definitely choose the model that includes the mom IQ between those two models. But Wait, yeah, I, next. I, I know. Okay. The next time we start from this last part. Yeah. Why 30, like why eight means that it's good. Like, I guess I haven't seen a lot of models. It doesn't make sense to me why eight, the SE difference of eight is good. No, no, it's not, the, it's not, it's relative to this, right? The difference between the two models is minus 38. That means that the fit one model is 38 
units worse than the Fit 3 model. Well, what 38 units, who cares? I don't know why that, is that a significant difference? Well, that's why I use the, 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 the standard error to say, oh yeah, it is significant. It's not just, fluff, not just by chance that it's lower. It really is lower, right? Just like any other time you do a parameter. But uh, I agree, let's- um, Let's stop here, yeah. Do you want me to, I'm gonna probably just pick up this again next time with the cross validation. Yeah. And I don't know, if, uh, do you want to, well, two options here. We could do that and then we could maybe look at a couple exercises from this chapter. And then yeah. Brian, we could push you off another week if you want. We could do this. That sounds good to me. Yeah, because this is this is like we really need to nail this. So I would actually uh I would actually write myself a note. I will work through um actually you could do this, like um we could assign people to do exercises. Well, I did 11.2, 11.3. Um put that in the chat. Hang on a minute. Where's the chat? We just stop sharing here for a second. Find the chat. Here's what I did, and I did 11. Point, well, 11.2 we did together. 11.3, 11.6, and I also did 11.9, 11.10. My plan would be next week to finish off this cross validation thing, and then do 11.9, 11. Point, and show my work on 11.9, 11.10 because those are about cross validation as well. But I could also show, or somebody else wanted to do one, like somebody else could do the 11.6 fitting the wrong model, which is this kind of cool concept. But yeah, if you guys want to pick up some problems to look at, I'll, I'll do I'll do 11.6. Okay, cool, great, yeah, I recommend. And um, I don't really want to do anything with time series, man. I don't. Me either. I, I've just given that to you. <laughs> hey, yeah, um, like I, I, I just feel like. <laughs> we're getting really deep now <laughs> yeah. yeah how about this i'll do 11 9 because um okay actually because it's, it's basically using the same dang model yeah um and then i, I guess 11 10 too because well i was planning to talk about 11 10 since i already have that prepared oh, okay well whatever yes. well, you should do it too don't get me wrong you should definitely do it do the problem because then we can compare notes, which would be really useful because I don't necessarily know that yeah. I did it right. I like I'm this. Pretty, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is good. All right, so next week we'll do a finishing up this chapter and then play with some exercises, which will help us. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody on to board with that? So I'll change oh, the schedule. I got to go. Sorry, guys. I'll oh, yeah. No worries. Yeah, I didn't realize what time it was. Sorry. You're going to be late. Yes. Uh, all right, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ama. Thanks, thank Frederica, so for much. showing up. Hopefully um, it was helpful. Yeah, Ron, it, I... I is like I'm getting to the end of my stats knowledge. So I feel like, I, is it okay if I, I'm in it? I ask a lot of questions, but it takes me a long time to actually prepare it. Like, cause it, it's very, that's why I've been not been able to lead because that's basically a lot of it is new to me. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's taken me, it yeah. did take me a little while to do this one too. It's starting to get a little, yeah. so maybe we might, I don't know if we might, I don't know, we'll see, we'll just play it by ear, but I was just thinking out loud that some of these chapters yeah. are faster than other chapters. You never know. So if there's a chapter that takes two weeks, we should take two weeks on it and not try to speed through this stuff. No, no, no. I was talking about last week because like it, it's, it was quite hard for me oh, to understand wait, what did was you, Did you watch the, did you watch the video? Because that's an acceptable way to do it too. We just kind of went through the book and like highlighted different parts. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way too. You don't have to do these like book down things you don't want to. I'm doing them because I, I like doing them. I'm trying to get practice doing it. So you can present however you want to, too. So no it's not that it's uh because usually we're trying to intersperse the leading but then it's because like i actually don't i'm still trying to understand what was, is okay. going on in the book so it's like it's hard for me to lead it when i don't really get what's going on that's why okay. yeah no worries yeah no worries so, you find a chapter you like i, I like i, I I like this way when I could bombard you with questions. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, but it's like, if you ask me any question, I won't be able to answer anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So no I worries. guess that's why I, I haven't signed up for any. And it's like lots of pressure when I have to sign up because it's like, I really, we're really getting. <laughs> yeah. That's true. It is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No worries. I, I really, I really appreciate this. It's, I think I, I'll probably have to 
do everything again, but at least I'll get a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. Yeah. That's how you do it. It's like circling the drains, yeah. so to speak. That's what I feel anyway. I keep going back on with these things over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. But it is fun. It is fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in a week. Yeah. All right. Bye.